Okay, so I, I promised I would do this three weeks ago, and then I said I would do this two weeks ago. Finally, we do it now. We'll talk about some of the more recent architectures. Um, the oldest one will be from 2012, um, which in neural networks, uh, uh, time calculation is like, you know, the last century or so. I mean, the, the 19th century. Um, and then uh, some of this will be from 2014, 2015, and then some very recent work a few days old. So um, I said previously that there have been this, these waves of popularity of neural networks, uh, these hypes followed by disappointment. And uh, the latest uh, uh, success arguably started in 2012. And uh, that was on the ImageNet challenge. The ImageNet challenge has a more a technically correct name, which is something like IRLSVC or some other permutation of these letters. Nobody can pronounce that, so everybody says ImageNet, but it's technically you know, not quite correct. Now, what is ImageNet? Um, this started, I believe, in uh, uh, natural language processing rather than image processing and people started creating a hierarchy of terms. Um, so for example, I've, I've opened this web page earlier today and you see there's you know plants and geological objects and natural objects. I opened sports and then I opened track and field and then jumping and high jump. So there's this hierarchy of concept from coarse grained to fine grained. Uh, and then I selected high jump and then you see uh, pictures of high jumpers. We see some duplicates. Yeah, so this is the same as that is the same as that. Um, but these are, you know, natural pictures of a, of a wide variety. And uh, the ImageNet challenge uh, was to um, correctly classify and possibly also um, locate uh, any one out of a thousand categories in a natural image and a million training images were available. And uh, this was um, a big contrast to previous challenges where the number of classes had been much smaller, like 20 classes was a typical number, and the training images had been in the hundreds or, or maximum thousands beforehand. And uh, so a few things came together in 2012, namely, um, uh, nice new tricks uh, like the rectifying linear unit and uh, dropout, um, fast GPUs, and lots of training data. And then, of course, smart you know smart students and professors. But uh, smart students have always been around. So it's really a couple of things that came together. And I forget the exact the exact numbers, um, but uh, the best neural network, um, the by now famous AlexNet. Uh, something like half the error rate of the other approaches. Yeah? So these are approximate numbers, but I think it uh, had something like 16 or so percent error rate and the best previous approach was more in the 25 or something. And uh, by the way, in the same challenge, um, the best error rates now have been uh, something like 4%, which is below the human error rate. And uh, actually in the latest edition of the challenge, they're not even asking or they're not so interested in the image classification task anymore. Now this is more about uh, detecting multiple objects in the same image and giving the precise location or interpreting what's going on in a scene and so on. Uh, but so there's this nice big uh, database of, of images and uh, the winning contribution at the time was this AlexNet from Hinton's lab. Uh, and I give you uh, I will show you two pictures of it. Um, so fundamentally, it used two pathways. Uh, the pathways were identical. And uh, well, they used two because they had, uh, I think the reason was that they had one computer with two GPUs in there. And uh, that was somehow you know, a good compromise between uh, share, you know, keeping or letting both GPUs uh, do something useful. Um, so what we see here, is a kind of representation where we have pixels here and pixels there. So this will show an input image. Um, then from left to right, we have uh, features or activation maps. 
And uh, then on the big scale from left to right, we have the layers. Uh, so this would be here layer one, layer two, layer three, and so on. And uh, let's look at the fundamental computations here. Uh, so we see that um, we actually have, um, so uh, here convolution masks of size 11 by 11 were used or learned, but these convolution masks um, were not densely placed on the image. So usually when we compute the convolution, we use our mask and we deplace it by one column at a time. But here, um, the convolution masks were displaced by four pixels horizontal, horizontally and vertically at a time. And that means that uh, the next image we get uh, has no longer uh, 224 pixels of uh, height, but only only 55 pixels. All right. And uh, now one filter would give us one result image, but actually uh, a second filter was learned and a third and so on. So in total, 48 filters uh, were learned here. Okay, so this is this number. All right. Uh, so this would be the first layer. Uh, and then um, results here were um, so not shown here is the nonlinearity, the uh, uh, rectifying linear unit. And uh, then after passing um, these uh, outputs of a neuron through the uh, nonlinearity of the neuron, uh, then these outputs uh, were maximized over a small region. So here, in this case, um, over how big a region, I'm not sure. So I think what happens is that, um, if, let me look at the different sketch here, if it's clear. Okay. Um, so uh, now a five by five uh, filter was uh, learned. And then the results of this five by five filter were max pooled. So um, out of two by two units, out of four units, only the strongest response uh, was passed on. And this is why we now go from a size of 55 to just 27. Uh, and then another convolution filter was learned and its outputs were again maximized over a small two by two window. So now we end up with something that size 13 by 13 and so on. Yeah? Uh, and let's look at them for a moment uh, at these filters. Um, so, for example, this uh, filter here uh, has dimensions 5 by 5, those are the pixels, uh, by 48, because there are this many features. But convolution only happens in the, in the pixel directions. Yeah? So there's no convolution happening across um, the features, because the whole signal, because I only have 48 channels. Okay? Um, and so here 48 filters were being learned. In the next stage, already 128 filters are being learned. And then 192 filters are being learned times two because there are also that many on the other GPU and so on. Um, so let me try and uh, draw an alternative picture of the same thing. I say from top to bottom are the pixels. I here pretend that my image um, simply has uh, only one spatial coordinate. Um, then if I did use a stride of one, which they did not do, yeah? but if I did use a stride of one, I would get out this many, uh, I would keep the same number of pixels, modulo perhaps some that I lose at the border. But in this case, I would already have uh, computed 48 different channels. Um, and 
now comes another set of convolutions. which are then max pooled. So this would be conf, this would be conf. Now comes the pooling operation, which halves um, the um, spatial extent and it keeps the same extent. So I still keep 128 um, channels here. Um, and the trend that you see here is that uh, with these repeated convolution and max poolings, <clears throat> um, I obtain here a picture that is very, very tiny. It's only 13 by 13 pixels, but it has very many features. And then comes a so-called fully connected layer. So what I, what I have here is, if you want to call it an image, it would be an image with a single pixel. But, uh, you know, I need to uh, change the scale here. Um, this now has 2048 channels, but just one pixel. Okay, so we have lost all spatial information. And uh, then there is, uh, uh, so each of these neurons is connected to all of the neurons in the next layer. Uh, I don't know how I should present it. So this one is connected to the first and to the second and to the third and so on up to the 2048. And then the second is connected to the first and to the second and to the third and so on. So, you know, very, very many parameters that I have here. And uh, in the end, um, this is connected to 1000 output neurons. Again, there's no spatial information, whatever left but I have 1000 output neurons and uh, each of these represent one class. So I have the softmax operation and uh, so I get some, uh, you know, I, I get a histogram if you like of activities here and uh, the bin with the greatest peak uh, is what I think uh, this image shows most dominantly. Okay, and I've, I've uh, you know, drawn it again here um, to introduce a kind of uh, schematic, which I will use uh, below later on. Okay, so um, bottom line is we have these repeated max pooling operations in space uh, that keep on reducing the uh, spatial extent. And uh, in a way, this is like marginalizing over where exactly the activity happens. Yeah? So it gives me translation Invariance, yes. So, uh, more, I mean, question on the technical side. They only split this on uh, two single CPUs, mm -hmm. and then how long did it take to the same? So, weeks or days? Or? Yeah, I think this was order of weeks at the time uh, because it has fairly many parameters. I forget, but I think it was weeks. Yeah. Um, and then, those, by the way, are uh, the results. Yeah. Um, so, here shown are a few images. And uh, then the five highest peaks. Yeah? So let's say this is peak number one, this is peak number two, the second highest, and then maybe this is number three, and this is number four, and this is number five. The five highest peaks are shown, and you can uh, see to what extent this network believes uh, that this is a container ship or a lifeboat or an amphibian. It doesn't really believe it's a fireboat, and it also, you know, so drilling platform is still more likely than the other classes, but it's not very likely. Yeah? So, so there's this histogram uh, that we see here. And we have that for all of the images. So for example, for the container ship, it was pretty sure. Um, for the motor scooter, it was less sure. Yeah? There are other classes which have a great uh, likelihood. Um, and yeah, Madagascar, CAT, it was not so sure either. Okay, and then uh, color coded, by the way, uh, in red, and in uh, uh, is the, the true class. Um, so here, for example, um, the true class was mite. Uh, the true class was container ship. Um, so here, the first hit was always the correct answer, motor, scooter, and leopard. Um, here, the correct answer was only the second most likely because the correct answer was the grill of the thing. 
but the network said convertible and it's not exactly an error error right i mean this is a convertible um and you know this is of course the favorite example of every new um, neural net person um the network says it's a dalmatian but no the correct answer is it's you know the image shows cherries yeah so so this would be um you you can compute the so-called top one error or the top five error so the top one error says how often is my first response the correct answer so uh, out of these eight images uh, four times the first response is the correct answer um, and in six times one out of the five first uh, hits is the correct answer yeah? so because the grill and the mushroom here they are the second hit so in the top five score that would still be counted as correct uh, but the cherry would be uh, you know a mistake because the network didn't uh, suggest cherry at all it only suggested dalmatian and grape and elderberry and something bull terrier and current okay so in 2012 everybody was blown away by you know how wonderful um, these things work and uh, then uh, by 2013 uh, you know everybody in the computer vision community was now doing the same thing they had done before but with neural networks uh, you know often at the time still going the baby steps and by 2014 many people had understood how to use them uh, properly to get good results um, so in 2012 this was a deep net yeah they said uh, depending on how you count uh, let's say seven layers um, then uh, when a 16 and a 19 layer net like the vgg net came out this was considered very deep and then uh, below i have a plot of a of a google net uh, from last year this is now 100 layers deep and uh, there has been a bit of a competition so there are now also people publishing uh, networks with a thousand layers uh, using stochastic depth um, but the so the agreement seems to be that uh, currently we don't manage to make the most of such deep networks that you know 100 layers or less is uh, you know, as much as anybody really needs in these days okay and you see so when the task is classifying so just saying what is in an image the pattern is always the same so you have a couple of uh, convolution layers then you do max pooling then you keep convolving you max pool and uh, in the end you have a few fully connected layers and if you compare this to earlier computer vision pipelines um, then uh, people like to say that this is the feature extraction stage and that is the classification stage this you know hard dichotomy doesn't really make sense yeah, because it's just one network which has been trained end to end but still yeah, this uh, this helps and uh, actually um, these features are very helpful um, so um, if you only have a small training set then a popular approach is um, to uh, train a big network on a big data set like ImageNet uh, then to uh, you know delete the weights in those last layers and then uh, on your new small data set uh, learn just these weights in the last few layers by back propagation and then you can you know either just stop your back propagation here or if you're really patient uh, you can also uh, keep back propagating further into the first layers to still improve the filters there a little bit but in many cases it's enough to just retrain um, the final few layers and uh, this is you know nowadays the no-brainer approach of uh, you know using a neural network when you have a small training set you just use a successful big network chop off the last layers and then retrain the last few and that works okay comments no I mean, no <laughs> Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, it's as simple as that, huh? <laughs>
So some people argue that all that a PhD student needs to know nowadays is gradient descent. I disagree. But <laughs> you know, these things work very well. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about a different set of architectures, uh, namely one for so-called semantic segmentation or image labeling. Um, so above we had an image as an input and at the end we just wanted to know is a certain class present or not, but we didn't care where. In semantic segmentation or image labeling you try to, um, on a pixel level, make correct predictions. I don't have a picture here, all right? Um, so you take an input image uh, as shown uh, uh, exemplarily here and then uh, on the output image uh, you would like to indicate that you know these pixels were covered by a plane and uh, the rest has been uh, you know whatever sky and, and this is ground etc. Yeah? So you want a pixel wise annotation of your image and I'm going to show you uh, now a sequence of a few networks uh, that have been developed since uh, 2014, just to show you, um, you know, to illustrate the rationale, how people are thinking about this and how a typical development would, would happen. Yeah. So um, the first uh, thing that people did was, uh, this is what's uh, shown here in black. If you ignore the green and the turquoise here, uh, you would take an input image and then you would convolve, uh, you would max pool, you would uh, convolve, you would max pool, and so on. And uh, then what these people suggested initially, so this F FCN32S um, was to, you know, take this result and upsample it to an output image. And um, let's talk about this upsampling. So, if we remember what convolution looks like in matrix notation, let's say for a 1D signal, if you remember uh, from the beginning of the semester, I would multiply this matrix with this one dimensional signal and I would get out a new one dimensional signal. And this matrix uh, had a special property, namely um, the entries in this matrix were just shifted by one. So this was a circulant matrix. Circular matrix implements convolution. Okay. Uh, if we now have a much smaller input vector, um, we have a small input vector, but we still want to get out um, a big output vector, uh, then I need to uh, uh, do this differently. I'm going to multiply from the left. Yeah? Let's say this is my small input vector and this is my matrix. This is matrix product. And then I'm getting out this result here. Sorry, I should have done the same format on the left-hand side. Uh, let me argue like this. Yeah? So this was the input. This was the matrix. And that was the output. And I have now argued for the case where I want, where I have a small input and I want to turn it into a, uh, a big output. Okay, so um, this uh, I can do that by um, constructing these matrices suitably. Yeah? Um, so you can use these uh, non-rectangular matrices both to upsample or to downsample. Uh, to, to downsample, you would just delete every second uh, column from the matrix, and to upsample, you introduce extra columns. So um, the 
identical values are not found in subsequent uh, rows, but the identical values are now found uh, at a different angle. Okay, so this is how you can uh, do interpolation. And this is what I meant by, uh, I have some high dimensional input after convolving and max pooling, I end up with something uh, with a much lower resolution. And that's what I meant by these arrows to say, okay, and I can then upsample that to a final output. Um, so this would be my prediction or my output, the black thing. And now at training time, uh, I've shown here in orange, uh, the target image, which tells me in which pixel I should have predicted sky and plane and cow and whatever. And uh, now my prediction is coupled to my target and uh, what I have tried to draw here was a spring, okay? A mechanical spring, just to say that my prediction is now coupled to my target uh, via the loss function. And uh, this is how information is backpropagated from my labels, from my targets, uh, through all these parameters. Now, what uh, Long and Co proposed was to um, not go directly or not only go directly from this uh, low resolution to the high resolution. So, you know, I could draw arrows in all of these places uh, and so on. Okay, this is getting too small. All right, uh, to not just use this arrow, um, but they propose to do this uh, upsampling in stages. For example, um, they proposed here in their network called FCN8S, um, they proposed to have uh, now a layer of intermediate resolution, which takes input on the one hand from these uh, high resolution Excuse me, uh, proper color. So the green layer here takes input from the low spatial resolution. But of course, we have lost a lot of geometric detail in all these down pullings. So the idea is to also use these skip layers here. These are called skip layers um, to carry over some of the geometric information. So the idea would be that um, here the deep layers, um, they carry the semantic information and the skip layers carry the geometric information. And this network actually uh, worked nicely, uh, but it, it does look a little asymmetric, doesn't it? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I've here redrawn it, uh, the same thing, in a different way. Um, this green layer is intermediate layer, and I've shown by arrows where it, it gets its input from, where it's sending its output to. Um, and this thing looks asymmetric. And I have now, uh, you know, drawn this already in an illustrative fashion, which anticipates the so-called UNet that makes all of this more symmetric. Yeah, so here is the unit architecture um, proposed by Olaf Ronneberger from Freiburg. And uh, what we see here are uh, layers of various resolution. So we have by and large a downsampling pathway and then an upsampling pathway. And the upsampling filters, by the way, we could just use the best signal processing upsampling filters uh, that, that we know from the first part of the semester, or we could also learn uh, the coefficients in these filters. But there are also these skip links, the ones that you see here. Yeah? So uh, I've written here, this would be the skip links, would be the geometric pathway, and then we have uh, down there the semantic pathway. Yeah? So the deep layers, uh, with their very many activation maps, they have a better idea of what a thing is, and the geometric pathway has a better idea of where one thing ends and the next one starts. 
So the geometric pathway can essentially be used to locate the boundary between objects and the semantic pathway can identify what class an object belongs to. And then the final output, in this case, if it's a foreground background segmentation task, I only have two layers at the very end. Um, these are then coupled again to my target. So the pink thing here would be the target. And this is again, you know, my, my sketch of a spring um, to say that this is the loss function coupling the output to the target. And uh, just by the way, uh, here, um, when you do a convolution, the question is always, what do you do at the very end of the signal? When we talked about the discrete Fourier transform, we pretended that the signal is periodic in space. So we fold the image, uh, we fold the image onto a torus. But we've also seen that it doesn't really make sense. Yeah? So uh, you could zero pad an image, or you could uh, continue the image by using mirroring boundary conditions, which are probably the best ones. Um, and then you lose no pixels, or you can just restrict your convolution um, to the valid region. But then you always lose a few pixels at the border. Yeah? So if you look closely, we go from 572 to 570, and then from 570 to 568. And the same thing happens also uh, throughout all the down and up sampling layers. And then at the very end, you know, we input a 572 by, by 572, but we output only a 388 by 388 map here. Okay, this is the unit architecture, um, which really works fairly well. Huh? So these people have tried it out on a large number of biological images, and it produces very nice results. Any questions for that? Yeah? So your final presentation is only restricted to the uh, small cross out test? Um, or could you yes. Say that up? Um, indeed, the segmentation, um, so if this was the input, then the segmentation is only produced for that subpart. And if your input image was bigger, uh, then you now need to tile such that these subparts, uh, you know, fill space completely. Yeah. Yeah. So this is research in neural networks, right? We uh, we draw pictures and argue which one we like better. Go ahead. So what do we have tracking in the last layer? So there's in Teradesic stuff there is like it has only two values. Yes. So is this only the binary distinction? Yes, for a foreground background segmentation task, that's all you need. Yeah. Um I didn't copy out figures from this paper. I'll show you a few figures after the break. Okay. Let's have a 15 minute break. So I picked out a picture for you. Uh, this is from the UNET paper. On the very left, you see the, the cells to be segmented. Not an easy task exactly. Huh? There's, if you squint a little bit of boundary information, but really we're already using a, a lot of prior knowledge because we know that cells or you know this type they somehow seem to be overall a bit more convex you know anyway there is not really much boundary evidence here you have to guess that there is there's a boundary here um, this is the ground truth provided um, this ground truth is now turned into a foreground background mask so whatever is labeled background is marked as background and wherever two foreground objects meet this is defined as background. Um, this is a trick. Um, this is a weight mask. You essentially use a truncated inverse distance from the closest foreground object, or from uh, you look at uh, you look for points where two objects are close by. 
Yeah? And uh, if two objects are close by at the same time, then you give this a high weight um, in the loss function and the remainder uh, a weight of one. And uh, then over here are some results. So for example, for the data shown in C, if you use a unit, uh, you get this segmentation here, which is quite respectable. Huh? So the segmentation is shown in colors and the yellow outlines are the ground truth provided. And arguably here, you know, if I look at this purple thing here, I like the prediction better than the ground truth. Yeah, so your question was, uh, does the two mean here this is only for two class? Yes, that's correct. This is just for foreground background. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, if you have more classes, you can simply have more layers and uh, more, more, more activation maps in that final layer and you will be able to predict more classes. Okay. Um, the paper I like is this one, uh, both for um, their summary of previous work and uh, their network and uh, also the, the performance they reach. Um, so they enumerate here uh, you know, different things that have been proven to help when designing an edge detection system. Uh, so you want uh, uh, carefully designed or learned features. Uh, you want the thing to be multi-scale. Um, then this is a bit may, a vague. Yeah? So com computer vision people, they always talk about gestalt laws. And this is a kind of catch-all term for uh, you know the capacities that humans have built in yeah, to recognize you know somehow good continuity or convexity and so on. Um, we always say that the computer vision systems are lacking them, but we're not quite sure you know what exactly we, we mean by that. Um, similarly, we like to talk about context. We are a bit more confident about what we mean when we say that. Um, so some algorithms they look at the images uh, through a small keyhole. And uh, in you know, images like uh, I've shown you here, so for example, if I just compute filters on a, on a small scale, let's say I compute a filter uh, which sees this much of the image, and if I feed that into a classifier, uh, and I'm not talking about a deep classifier now, just you know, a standard SVM or something, um, then on such a small scale, it's very difficult to make the decision or impossible to make the decision if there's a cell boundary or not. Yeah? So you indeed need more context. Yeah? Um, so this is what, uh, what they mean by context here. Um, yeah, then this thing, make holistic predictions is again a little bit more vague. And uh, yeah, if you can, then you should exploit 3D geometry and address occlusion boundaries. Now the most famous uh, edge detection benchmark is this one, the Berkeley segmentation data set and benchmark. Um, they used a number of, um, well, volunteers to uh, outline all the edges in the image. And uh, they were not super specific in, um, the, in their instructions on how to do that. And uh, so what you see often is that for a given input image, uh, the humans come up with very different results as to what is the correct segmentation. So subject number two um, outlined all the individual circles here uh, or all parts of the pattern, or there is an image uh, um, of a house with a fence uh, and Latin sound and you know, most people just said, okay, this is the limit of the fence, but some people were very meticulous and you know, outlined every piece of wood in this whole fence. Yeah? Um, so you have these different answers, and then these different answers are simply averaged pixel-wise to produce a boundary strength. And then the task is for other algorithms to predict this boundary strength, and uh, you know, as already the humans, disagree, this is a hard problem. And it's a hard problem, especially because humans sometimes infer boundaries where there aren't any. So there's one image 
um, where uh, there's a lot of shadow and a human face is shown. And if you look closely, you don't really see the limit of where the face ends and the wall starts. But, you know, us humans, we have a strong prior of what is the shape of a face. So everybody drew, you know, that edge in the face. But if you look in the pixels, it's not really there. So, so that's quite, that's why it's a challenging uh, benchmark for algorithms. And uh, probably a thousand PhD student years, I'm not kidding you, uh, have been spent on, uh, you know, optimizing the results. Um, so all of these algorithms have some kind of sensitivity threshold or so, which you can adjust. And uh, so each algorithm, as you vary your threshold, makes a compromise between precision and recall. So recall is how many of the true edges did you find and precision is of the edges that you claim there are, how many are actually there. And, um, you know, so the algorithms became better and better and, uh, you know, sometimes worse. Uh, so, so, you know, each PhD adds, you know, one, one new line to this graph and shown here is only a subset of these, of these lines. Um, but the point is that the methods, you know, went really into saturation here. Uh, and then, you know, look at this huge jump. <laughs> um, I, I'm serious about big jump now. Um, that was accomplished by this paper. Uh, so in a, in a field on which, or on a benchmark on which so many people have worked and in a field which is so saturated, it's not easy to achieve, you know, a, a step this big. Uh, and by the way, this is human performance. Uh, so this is the gap, uh, uh, this is the Gestalt laws uh, that we're missing. Okay. Um, so that's the problem they're trying to solve. And uh, here's their proposal of how to do that. Uh, so this time the uh, layers of the neural network are arranged from back to front. Uh, you see indicated by the length of these boxes how many filters you have in a given layer. And uh, there are two interesting things about the network. Um, one is that uh, all of these outputs of the layers are combined in trying to come up with um, a compromise prediction of where there is a boundary and where there is not. And secondly, um, so the, the compromise image is not shown here. Uh, so they have a compromise image, uh, which I should maybe draw here. And then this compromise image is coupled to the ground truth. Uh, but they do not only inject the ground truth here, they also inject uh, the ground truth uh, at all these other stages. Yeah? So they compare the output of each, or they let each stage produce an output, which they then compare after suitable uh, downsampling of the ground truth with the ground truth. So I've tried to sketch this in the same kind of picture that uh, you know we've had repeatedly. Uh, so this is a unit kind of picture um, where, uh, you know, this would be, so from top to bottom, I have various scales. From left to right, I have various layers. And uh, so this is like in unit, yeah, we, uh, we have various uh, downsampling and convolution layers. Um, all of these uh, layers collectively um, contribute here um, to predicting an output image, which I sketched here. And uh, this output image is coupled to your ground truth. But the ground truth is now also coupled uh, to all of these intermediate layers. And uh, that seems to be um, a strong trick um, to help train such systems from limited data uh, that you inject a little bit of gradient, not only at the very end of a deep network, but also in intermediate places. And if you want to look at results, so this is an image from the paper. Uh, you see the original image and, you know, there are many boundaries here. And even for a human, you know, it's not very easy to say, you know, where exactly does the uh, leg end. Um, this is uh, the average of what several human annotators thought, and uh, this is the output by this uh, network, um, holistically nested edge detection. 
and in the rows, uh, in, in this row here, you see how the various layers uh, do in approximating this uh, uh, this output. So essentially, these first few layers they give you a high geometric resolution, but they do not yo uh, they do not yet know what is a meaningful boundary and what is not. Huh? So we have um, all these you know crisp sharp uh, boundaries up here, and only the deeper layers decide that you know nah that doesn't seem to be what the image is all about. Huh? And here they, they disappear. And then at the bottom, by the way, is what a classical edge detector would do for you. So pretty impressive results. Okay, and we've now seen a few ideas. Um, so it's quite natural to try and uh, mix and match these and uh, one attempt to mix and match here, this is uh, uh, from, uh, from last month, this paper, uh, is to talk about these convolutional fabrics. The idea is obvious from this image, I think. Um, so each node in this uh, trellis graph here would correspond to one set of activation layers at a given scale and at a given depth in the network. Uh, so um, it's best explained by example. We start with the full resolution input, and then uh, this is downsampled by a factor of two, so we go up in, in scale space, and then this is again downsampled, so we go up in scale space, and then we continue with a couple of convolutions and nonlinearities at the same scale. Okay, so this was the green trajectory, um, then uh, Similarly, uh, this thing here corresponds to the uh, to the red trajectory in this space, and then this U-net kind of architecture, um, well, is the blue thing here. But in U-net, we also had these skip layers. Um, so these skip layer layers, um, this present paper doesn't do it, but you would want to implement it by simply passing on the information without doing anything. Yeah? So you would like to uh, simply have um, a Dirac as a filter, and you would like to have the linear function as, um, you know, so no, no nonlinearity. Yeah? So that would be a skip layer. Um, but what these authors also propose is to, well, you know, why not use all of that at once? So we uh, will train the thing by backpropagation and we simply uh, let the network decide which of these filters it really wants to use. Um, by the way, uh, where you inject the output depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, so for classification tasks, you would inject the output at a, a very coarse scale. For semantic segmentation, you would inject the output uh, or you would inject gradient um, at, so certainly at the finest scale, but maybe also at coarser scales, as we've seen in the previous paper. And then, by the way, you know, this looks like a beast because it has so many uh, filters, uh, so they use some sparsity um, in a fully connected layer here. They don't connect each neuron to every neuron but they, have, uh, they only connect uh, neurons that are in some, uh, in some vicinity. Okay, so those are um, the neural fabrics. Um, and ourselves, we're currently working on an architecture uh, which uh, has some of these elements of uh, the holistically nested, yeah, so injecting uh, gradients at various depths, um, but we also want to use uh, skip layers that are not in here explicitly. That's a little bit related to these uh, convolutional fabrics. Any questions so far? All right. Um, then I want to talk about two tricks. Maybe I was too fast. Any questions so far? 
give you another chance. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is implemented. Um, it, I forget the exact result. It works pretty well, I think. Uh, so they, they say state of the art. I'm not sure if it exceeded state of the art, but uh, I would have to look it up. Oh. Sorry. Maybe another question I can answer. <laughs> So they were at least as good as previous work. Um, otherwise, I might not have shown it here. Um, what I like about it is, you know, this sort of symmetry of the whole thing, and that it subsumes some of the previous architectures that, that we've seen further up. Other questions? Okay. Um, so in the remaining time, I want to talk about two tricks. Um, one of them is pretty orthogonal to everything we've seen before, um, the so-called inception layers um, that are an important element in the Google Net. Um, so first, let me show you the Google Net. Uh, on the top is uh, inception fifth generation which had 20 some layers uh, at the bottom is inception seventh generation which i have i have not counted maybe 30 layers or something but uh, as i said earlier they've now gone to 100 layers in the meantime and uh, the problem you know if you make these networks so deep is that the number of parameters becomes too much uh, you know, even for the number of GPUs that Google has and even for the amount of data that, that Google has. So you need to somehow, um, yeah, you need dimension reduction. Uh, and uh, you already see uh, a little bit, uh, you know, this, this meta structure here. Um, there are these uh, WASP tails. And uh, let me zoom in and, and show how that works. So in these sketches, I always show pixels from top to bottom and then features from left to right. And if we now use a one by one convolution, um, let's say with a nonlinearity, then uh, this turns it into an image with just as many pixels, but with a single activation. So one by one convolution is the same as, you know, depending on the activation. If I use a sigmoid, this would be the same as doing a logistic regression. So, for example, uh, if these are 48 layers and this is one layer, uh, this would be a logistic regression in a 48-dimensional space, and I simply apply it pixel by pixel. So, this is what a one-by-one -one convolution does. And uh, you know, let, let me return to the AlexNet, which does not use dimension reduction. So for example, the, the filters that we learn here, they are three by three in the image domain, but they are times 27. Uh, no, sorry. They are times 128 because um, there are that many channels. So that's, you know, even if, if you do this uh, across 100 layers, that's a lot of parameters. Uh, so what they do is that um, they take a block like this. So um, this was now, uh, in this case, it was 27 by 27 spatially times 128 channels. And then they pass it, or what Google would, would do in an inception layer, you would pass this through a one by one convolution and then you get out a 27 by 27 by one. So the next filter will only be three by three by one instead of three by three by 128. So this is the idea of inception. Um, so what I just showed out of inception would be just this pathway here. So you come from the previous layer, you use the one by one convolution, and in this case, they've even added a, a max pooling. This was inception generation number five. Uh, let me you know, show in, instead of uh, here 
generation number six. So what I showed would, would be this. Yeah? So just a dimension reduction. And um, now that alone is maybe too restrictive. So you complement it with other filters. For example, here there's first a dimension reduction, one by one, uh, but then uh, they use another spatial filter on top. Uh, or in this case, here on the right-hand side, there is no dimension reduction, there's only a spatial reduction. And then, and then comes a dimension reduction. Uh, so this was Inception 6 and in Inception 7, uh, they further proceed to replace um, the three by three convolution with something like a separable filter, but it's not quite the same. So if I have a three by three filter, um, I can rewrite this as, uh, this is now a convolution operation, uh, you know, outer product or convolution of this, plus uh, convolution of that, plus uh, the same thing a third time. Um, here uh, in this pathway, in this pathway here, they're just using uh, one, a rank one uh, approximation to a three by three filter, but it's not quite what I'm drawing here um, because uh, in my notation, there's non, no nonlinearity happening here. Uh, so I would write, this is a convolution, let's say of a horizontal um, with uh, a vertical, let's say it's a convolution of a horizontal with a convolution of a vertical filter and my input. Uh, but they um, use another nonlinearity in between, yeah? so it's not quite the same as having a separable filter. So, you know, this was in section five, this was in section six, this was in section seven. Uh, is this the result of some Schrodinger equation? Unfortunately not. No? This is a uh, very extensive empirical work and good intuition and, you know, a lot of tweaking and tuning that goes into um, refining these micro architectures. It is super useful, but I don't find it super stimulating uh, intellectually. Yeah? Um, now that said, they work really well. Yeah? So they, they uh, give you a notable uh, difference in performance and uh, it makes sense. So whenever previously, you know, I just uh, uh, casually uh, drew an arrow and, and a bar. In all of these places, you could use an inception layer instead. And uh, in, many, in many places, it's actually very useful to do that. Okay, so inception layers are one useful trick. And uh, that lets you that allows you to train even deep networks such as this uh, while keeping the total number of parameters within somewhat reasonable ranges. Okay. Um, then a final trick for today I wanted to show you is uh, pruning. Um, I think this is a space that has not been explored yet to the extent that it should. Um, the idea here is extremely simple. You uh, train a neural network. You train it with a uh, regularization, in this case an L1 or an L2 regularization um, to make your weight smaller. So in the stochastic gradient descent, uh, L2 regularization is obtained by just making your weight vector a little bit shorter in every stochastic update step. Yeah. And uh, then uh, weights that end up with really small values, you can just uh, drop them completely. You set them to zero. And uh, in this case, uh, or in this sense, uh, you can uh, you know, drop out connections as you see here on, on the right-hand side. 
And uh, well, this will help you at train time, especially when we're, when you're working on a, on a CPU or not on a GPU. Um, so these authors um, tried both L1 and L2 regularization. And some of you are in the seminar and have seen the benefits of L1 regularization, or you've given a talk about it even. Um, so, you know, it's unsurprising that uh, we have uh, accuracy loss here. So we want to be um, So given the, the convention of uh, a sign that they choose, we want to be as high as possible on this plot. Um, and from left to right, we have the number of uh, uh, connections that, that we prune out. And uh, what they find is that, uh, and this is unsurprising, uh, that when you use L2 regularization or when you use L1 regularization, you find you get much better predictions or a smaller drop in accuracy if you use L1 regularization. So, so far this is completely expected and unsurprising. Uh, and now comes something uh, which I think uh, is an interesting research topic, uh, namely if given now this uh, stump or this remaining network, if you now again fine tune the weights, then suddenly the L2 network becomes better. Yeah? So um, this one here, the orange line is L1 plus retrain and the green one is L2 plus retrain. Uh, so somehow, you know, the remaining connections, if you don't retrain, um, are better if you use L1, but if you do retrain, they become worse than if you use the L2 regularization. It's completely not understood and it's a very interesting phenomenon. So the you know first thing to try out would, would be just to see if uh, you know this care this was now on a specific data set, uh, if this is indeed a general finding or not. Uh, um, and then by the way, um, if you iteratively uh, do this, then you end up with a red curve here. So you see that uh, you can uh, you know uh, discard 90% of your network and still have the same accuracy as the full network essentially. Okay. So this is some, this is uh, a topic that I believe merits a lot more attention than it currently gets because people are so much in a frenzy of producing better results that, you know, they just buy another five GPUs and don't care about this. Um, but I think there's something to be learned here. So um, this is uh, pruning, and I'll not talk about letter networks uh, today, but just make a, a final comment here. Um, so this is a slide from uh, Vanzato, and uh, he, you know, like the, the headline says, you know, why are convolutional nets so successful today? And uh, to me, um, as some of you know, I was very reluctant to, uh, you know, start and do research in new networks at all because I didn't like the empiricism in it, yeah? this uh, playing with parameters and so on. Um, but what what is true is that uh, we are getting more and more training data, and what is also true is that we're getting uh, faster and faster CPUs and GPUs. And if you look at um, traditional algorithms, you know, like the support vector machine or the random forest or whatnot, uh, you have a relatively low computational cost. Uh, this is what I try to trace out here. And even with a small amount of training data, you, you already do very well. Yeah? So you have a very steep learning curve. Uh, with new neural networks, on the other hand, uh, so I've, I've fixed here the flops per second by saying, you know, random forest is a cheap algorithm and let's say a neural network is an expensive algorithm. Really, I should do a 3D plot, which I cannot do for you. Yeah? So I'm, I'm showing these lines here for a constant uh, computational cost. Uh, neural networks, um, they need much more training data and they need um, you know, much more computational power, but eventually they, they do better. Yeah? And uh, so neural networks 
are better able um, to profit from the huge amounts of training data that are becoming available for standard problems like pedestrian recognition and you know everything all these problems that are covered by ImageNet um, they are becoming better you know if you make your network deeper if you have enough training data results tend to get a little bit better and you go into saturation only at a pretty late stage um, so all of this is good um, the interesting open research problems are uh, what to do in the limit of very little data little training data uh, so I've, I've already said that empirically um, pre-training a network on something and then on, only fine-tuning it on a small data set um, that works pretty well um, but there is a little uh, you know there's I would say there's no theory about it and even when I say relatively uh, that depends on how far left you are on this axis yeah so um, with classical machine learning algorithms uh, you you do already well often with just a tiny fraction of labels and even with a pre trainal network you may need a few more um, to obtain good results okay so uh, today has been very very high level um, we've looked at uh, some of the uh, generic uh, architectural elements and uh, how they can be uh, combined and I bring up again this uh, picture here um, I have uh, so it it does so the big ideas were, were that we want to use skip layers to carry over the geometric information uh, we want to have uh, deep layers uh, to uh, have a rich uh, semantic representation uh, and I've been saying that it is useful to inject output or to inject gradient not only at the very end but also at intermediate layers and if you, uh, you know, mix and match some of these ideas of today uh, and if you have enough training data and if you have a big enough GPU uh, you're guaranteed to do pretty well <laughs> on uh, whatever problem you will look at. Thank you.